And I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to see so many uh, acquaintances and old friends here and to be invited to be here. I, I will tell you that when John called me uh, to invite me or emailed me to invite me, I said, oh, my, you know, this is, this is a mistake. I, I don't do clinical judgment. I do a lot of things in philosophy of medicine and in ethics, but I've really never done anything on clinical judgment. So I wrote back and said, it's very nice of you. But I said, well, I guess there is something. I mean, if you think of clinical judgment as a question about how to settle on decisions about diagnosis and treatment, um, then at certain times you have, obviously have to go to the patient and say, what, what, what do they want? And, and this can be an issue of clinical judgment. When do you go to the patient to ask them what they want? And once you do, what do you tell them in the process of their decision making? And so I can take my patient decision making um, projects, which, which are very, very uh, underway and very busy, uh, and I could apply it here. And if you'd be interested in that, I'd be happy to do that. And he wrote back and said, great. So we'll see if he was right. Um, in, in some ways, this is something completely different in the words of Monty Python. Uh, in some ways, it's, it's, it's not, because one way it overlaps is that oh, we'll be talking about some of the questions about rationality and theories of rationality, I guess, applied more on the patient side. And when we recognize those rationality issues, those, those problems and questions about rationality, how do we talk to patients about their choices, which is so often, and of course, maybe increasingly often, what we do in clinical medicine. So that's what I'll talk about today. There we go. First, my acknowledgments. I have a wonderful team of people I work with at Indiana University, where I am. And I'll mention here Eric Meslin at the top of the front line there. He was University of Toronto for a bunch of years, then came to a few places, and then Indiana, where he hired me. And I'm going to shout out to him, a brilliant and uh, wonderful man, who is now back in Canada. I do not make any money from this work, except for my salary and occasional trips. OK, so debating the value of comparative risk, let me tell you about that. So providing information about an individual's specific risk for a disease could guide decisions about prevention, allowing a truly personalized prevention. That was the terminology a couple years ago. Personalized risk and benefit calculators are available for many diseases, including heart disease, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer. We call it colon cancer. Genomic analysis that's coming, you guys may have noticed, a lot of genetics going on, will provide a lot of specificity, supposedly, some more specificity perhaps, and it'll be precision medicine. But little's known how to give this kind of data to patients and when to do it, which I'll be talking to you about today. So for this talk, I have to distinguish between personal risk and comparative risk. Many of you may be familiar with this distinction, but I'll lay it out here. Personal risk is the probability of being diagnosed or dying from a disease and the amount of risk reduction that can be provided by a preventive intervention. Comparative risk is how the individual's risk compares to that of others, usually about whether it's above or below the average for people of that gender and age. Studies in multiple settings, really many studies, have shown that comparative risk information has a larger impact, or at least a very significant impact, on um, uh, risk perception and risk behavior, and probably larger than actually just the straight personal risk numbers. So here's some examples to iron down, you know, nail down this distinction for you. So personal risk, you can tell a person their baseline risk, which is you have a 6% chance of developing breast cancer in the next five years, or if you're a frequency person, you can say of 100 women like you, six will develop breast cancer in the next five years. You can describe risk reduction. That's about personal risk too. If you take this pill, it'll reduce your chance of developing breast cancer in the next five years to 3%, or if 100 women like you take this pill, three will develop breast cancer in the next five years. And of course, there are graphs to do this. I should use these in my research on patient decision making. This is an icon chart, nice one we use here for colon cancer. If these 1,000 women people, so these 1,000 little stick figures, uh, and, and there are 1,000, I find that audiences spend their time going one, two, three, yeah. It's, it's 20 blocks of 50, I believe. Um, and so uh, if these 1,000 stick figures do not get screened, 30 will die from colon cancer. Those are the ones shaded red. Screening tests, we explain, um, if they do get this stool test every year and do the follow-up testing, our models suggest that not 30 will die, but just six will die. So again, showing things with a graph. Personal risk, all personal risk communication. Here's comparative risk. Comparative risk is something else. It's your risk is significantly above average for women your age, or your risk of developing breast cancer in the next five years is double the average. You want to be more specific? It's comparative, but specific. Or you can say your risk of developing breast cancer is 6%, and then you, then you add for the comparative part, the average risk is only 3%. And again, there are graphical presentations there. OK. So personal risk versus comparative risk. Is there some kind of battle here? Let me explain a little bit of a battle, a battle royale. 
So decision aids are booklets, videos, or websites that explain options available for medical care. They're designed to help patients make a good decision when there's no single best option. So doctors don't do such a good job, we'll have computers and booklets do it, and we can program these um, how we want to give the information that we want. Many experts recommend that decision aids, and actually their providers, um, should present personal risk information when it's available using numbers charts. So patients should get this. There's very little disagreement about that. There's actually some interesting debates there I could talk about. But um, The debate I want to talk about is that some experts say, yeah, give the personal risk, but do not give the comparative risk, right? Um, it's, it'll, it'll interfere with the consideration and application of their personal risk information. And this came to mind, in my, in my mind, I noticed it, in a paper, a very good paper by Angela Fagel and, and her colleagues at the University of Michigan at the time, which said, if I'm better than average, then I'm okay. And it was uh, ran in a very good journal for medical decision making about patient education and counseling. So it was, it was a case model on tamoxifen. Tamoxifen, I've got medical students here. The course organizers are both medical students are graduating, I guess, in one case. Okay, so tamoxifen, and we have lots of doctors in the audience, I know. Okay, and, and others who might know about this. So tamoxifen and others in health. Hey, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> going to restart. Okay, here's the case. Tamoxifen um, reduces the chance of developing breast cancer, right? So it's a, it's a prevention treatment for people at an elevated risk of breast cancer. However, it carries a risk of hot flashes, which are very common in people taking tamoxifen, cataracts, which occur but are rare, and heart attacks and strokes can be caused, which is very rare but happens. So this is considered to be a truly preference-sensitive decision, one where the medical decision-making, the, the judgment of clinical is to give it to the patient to decide. Women have to decide for themselves. Women in the group whose risk is high enough for this to be an option um, have to decide for themselves whether the benefit, which is reducing the chance of developing breast cancer, outweighs all those risks. It's considered to be something the patient has to choose. The doctor should not choose. The provider should not choose for the patient. So here's what they did. So they, um, whoops, boy, I lost the whole thing. Da, 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 da. How are you? Very good. Okay, I'm good. Okay. So women uh, at a hospital ca cafeteria, this is how we got run-of-the-mill people before we had, you know, Mechanical Turk and uh, online panels. Women were asked to imagine they have a 6% chance of developing breast cancer in the next five years and that taking a pill would reduce that to 3%. Again, it's modeled on tamoxifen. They also were all told that the pill causes hot flashes in most women, cataracts in 1% to 2%, and stroke or heart attack in under 1%. So they all got that. Now, they were randomized to two groups in this additional piece of information. Half were told, that 6% personal risk you have, that is double the average risk. So the average risk is 3%, you have double the average risk. The other half, again, also told they had 6% personal risk, were told, 6%, that's your risk. Let me tell you, that's not so bad. On, on, they didn't say it that way. They said it's, it's, it's below average. It's half the average. The average is 12%. So they basically randomized them to getting the comparative risk. They all got the same personal risk and side effects. I'm going to kill this computer. Every time I press the down button, it thinks I want to go to the beginning of the talk. Okay. Now, um, what were the outcomes? Well, compared to those who were told that their risk was below average, so look at the ones below average. Those who were told the risk was above average were, were more interested in taking the pill and thought it was a better pill to take, thought it was more beneficial. So being told the comparative risk did make a difference in their willingness to take the pill and their opinion of the pill. And most respondents, when they asked, how do you like this information? Was it helpful to you? They said they did like it. What I was interested in is what the authors said next. In their conclusion, they said, we contend that the comparative risk information in this study was uninformative and should not have changed risk perceptions. They said, we believe, let me reset my clock here, make sure I know what time it is, okay. Yeah. They said, we believe that a person's decision should not be based on whether they consider themselves at low or high risk, but rather on whether they think that the benefits of the treatment outweigh the risks. In fact, because of our results, we excluded comparative risk information from our tamoxifen decision aid. They showed the comparative risk information had an effect, and they said it was not an effect they believed should happen. So I'm a philosopher. I thought I'd try to figure out exactly what they were saying. They actually weren't very forthcoming. They just sort of said this like it was pretty obvious. So here's what I think their argument was. Um, they think that information about personal risk of breast cancer, risk reduction provided by the pill, and probably of specific side effects is all the subjects needed to know to make a fully informed choice about whether to take the pill. Um, knowing whether the individual's risk level is above or below average, separate from the personal risk, is irrelevant to evaluating the treatment. 
That's information about other people, right? It's about whether other people have high or low risk. You've already found out what your risk is. Why would it change your decision to find out that some people are out there with 12% risk or some people are out there with 6%? Your risk has been told to you. Why are you being swayed by this other irrelevant piece of information? Here's a quote. If a prevention strategy um, reduces a person's risk by half, it should not matter whether others receive greater or lesser benefit from the pill. It shouldn't matter. It's irrational to give it. Okay, so I wrote some defenses. I thought, well, that's not really right. There's actually more to be said here. They are, they are oversimplifying the process. And this actually gets to the issues of rationality that I want to talk about today. So here's my first point. First, beliefs about comparative risk can play a role in decision making, even if comparative risk information is not provided. Right? So people may think, a person may think that her personal risk is below average when it's actually above average. Just leaving it out of decision aid doesn't keep it off the table. People develop all kinds of views about whether their risk is above or below average. It may be affecting their feelings, and they just may be wrong. So a woman may think her risk of 6% is below average, and so might downplay the, the importance of addressing it. We know the comparative risk information has an effect. Letting her know it's above average corrects a false belief. So just leaving it out does not get you off the hook. Still could be in their mind. Second point. The impact of comparative risk information could counteract the impact of other heuristics and biases. It's not the only one out there. For example, again, we're in a group, probably a lot of people here are very familiar with these biases. I'll just describe them quickly. The optimism bias is the tendency to assume you will be one of the lucky ones. So for example, you hear that 45% of people like you will get a heart attack and you're sure you won't. You just, you're sure, it just can't happen. You're an optimist. Second, the availability heuristic. So you value information you've just heard even if there's no reason to value that information more. So there are lots of heuristics out there. Those are two of the famous ones. And in both cases, you might use, it might, it might be, whether you plan it or not, the comparative risk information will basically balance uh, those, the effect of those, of those heuristics. Here's how. A woman underestimates the importance of her personal risk of 6% due to the optimism bias. Uh, hearing that her personal risk is above average could counteract the bias and lead her to, to see the risk as being important. So we're counteracting a bias that's there. One bias is balancing another. It's very well to eliminate one if you knew there were none others at play, but there are others at play. Here's another one, the salience heuristic or the availability heuristic. A woman may not know any other women taking tamoxifen. This one's actually suggested to me by the editor of that journal that was published in. And so may be inclined to discount the reasons for taking it or the risk it addresses. They say, oh, I've never heard of that. It can't be important. That's not right, right? That doesn't make it not important just so you don't know anybody with it. Hearing that her personal risk is above average could counteract that heuristic. So again, um, there could be value. So here's my overall point from this little paper. Um, the importance of gist is should not, be, should not be forgotten. People can hear numbers, they form gist, and people rely on potentially inc in incorrect information and emotional and subconscious factors like heuristics when forming their gist impression of risk and choosing a course of action. Therefore, normally evaluating the role of a particular heuristic or bias in decision making is difficult. You can't just assume it the way they did on that last page of that, page of that paper. So, oh, well, it must not be helpful. Ah, oh, they must, if they want to show these things, that for example, it doesn't have these nice effects I described, they probably have to study something. Maybe study the rationality of decisions of people hearing or not hearing comparative risk. Maybe actually looking at the actual people. I'm not just making a jumping to conclusions. Well, what would that research look like? Well, okay, part two. And I'm on time here. I will be done ahead of time, 20 minutes. That's all I care about. Quality of the paper, zero. Timing of the paper, <laughs> priceless. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> So here's what uh, a, lot of, again, a lot of people in this room know. It's a great place to be talking about this. I talk about this at med school sometimes. People look at me cross-eyed. That will happen here for different reasons. Okay, so previous assumption of the sort of standard model, people call it, right, is that rational decision-making is utility maximization. Um, you consider all the possible outcomes of each choice that you have. Choose the action that has the highest expected utility, the one with the weighted, highest weighted average of utility of possible outcomes weighted by probability of occurrence. Okay, standard picture. Now, from this perspective, I actually worked this out in the first paper around this. In fact, I kind of learned expected utility theory writing the first paper, that um, comparative risk information is suspect since it does not directly relate to the utility of the outcomes or their probability, right? The probability was told in personal risk. That was told by personal risk, 6% chance of occurring. Utility, what's the utility of a heart attack? And it doesn't matter whether other people get heart attacks. That's your, so that's, I can see lurking behind this paper this commitment to the standard picture to uh, seeing people as expected utility maximizers. Um, 
But look, as again, a lot of people here know, right? There's, there's, there are problems with the standard picture, you could say. It's very ill. It's, it's on its deathbed. Um, there, there's basically, you could say, this limited time and resources, brain power, just time, um, which makes it rational to make choices based on shortcuts or fast frugal heuristics in Gigerenzer's or somebody's phrase. We can satisfy. Satisfy can be a very rational choice. And by the pragmatic conception of rationality that grows out of this, we'd say what it is for a reasoning process to be a good one is for it to be an efficient means of attaining the pragmatic objective of satisfying one's personal goals and desires, to borrow some nice words from Samuel Stitch and Foucher. So in this case, of course, heuristics aren't bad. They can be very efficient for getting you there. So this bias against bias, right, this bias against heuristic, look, well, call paper that, the bias against bias. The only thing I care about as much as timing of talks is titles for talks. So, okay. so how a value, so how would you do this kind of empirical work that we're recommending, right? Where you look into whether this was an efficient way to help people pursue their utility satisficing. Um, uh, so you, you might ask this question of the third bullet point here. How well do people satisfy their utility when they receive personal risk information but not comparative risk information? And how about when they also receive, you have to compare them. Have to be a, a randomized trial, where you randomize people to groups they got or did not get. And this, of course, if you did this trial, it would require some empirical measure of whether individuals have satisfied their preferences. But let's take a moment to think about how hard that is, right? Not just to know whether they maximize, bad enough to try to measure people's, whether people's preferences met, match their outcomes, but also measure whether they even satisfied. So, so um, here's, here's what a randomized trial would show in this case. We actually kind of know. I mean, I'm going to guess, right? Women at elevated risk for breast cancer who are told their risk is above average are slightly more likely than the ones who weren't told it, right, to choose to take tamoxifen, those who are told personal risk alone. We, we kind of know that from the trial they did. If it works out the same way in real life, they're going to have more women taking it. Was that a good way to satis maximize your satisfy your utilities? I don't know. I mean, we can't just assume it's bad because they aren't expected utility maximizers, they might have been satisficing, or they might have been counteracting the biases. How would you measure that? Right? They have a higher risk of cataracts and stroke. They have lower risks of breast cancer. That's how the pill works. Was that a good or bad outcome? We're supposed to ask them, but we don't know whether to ask them with or without the data that we showed them. It really becomes incredibly impossible. <laughs> so um, uh, you know, measuring utility, as we all, many of you know, is almost impossible anyway. Evaluating the efficiency of processing, of satisfying is, is really difficult. So, so I just, I, I, it's like a, it's a bit of a negative paper that way, right? From saying, don't assume anything, but it's actually an important negative paper because people have been assuming. I actually gave a paper on this topic with some empirical research we've done, which I'm happy to talk about later. If people want, I can show you my slides, which are not, not in the set. Um, we did some empirical work on this. And when I stood up to give the empirical paper at an empirical conference, my favorite conference I was telling Miriam, sat at the Society of Medical Decision Making, the first question from the audience was, of course you can't give comparative risk information. That is you know, incorrect. You can't do that. I said, well, didn't you read my paper? And that's when I wrote the second paper, which they haven't read as well. Okay. So, so here's, the, here's another thing you could do. You could look when you get really sad about trying to figure out these other hard empirical questions. You could just measure the process of decision making. Maybe you could measure something like, okay, I want to know people have adequate information. You know, maybe that's the question, not the outcomes. Well, then you have other questions. How much is enough? What does it include? Does it include comparative risk? If you're going to see whether people have adequate information, you're actually begging the question either way. And um, you might ask how people feel about their decision, which has its own problems. People might feel great about horrible decisions. I think people don't know. You might evaluate the patient-provider discussion, but again, it's, it's, it's really bad. I think it's actually really hard to come to any clear conclusion. Um, ethics, you might hope, is going to help you here. When philosophy fails, go to ethics, the last ignoble place to go. So, so whether information is pertinent or material is to be measured by the significance a reasonable person would attach to it in deciding this decision in front of them, in that case a procedure. Well, we actually know that from the Fagelin paper. They did ask them, you know, did you like this information? Did you find it pertinent? And patients said, yeah, they did. They liked it. They said, yeah, I liked having that information. I liked knowing I was above average risk. So if you go the ethics way, it looks like you should probably let them have it. Let them have it. Let them have it. Okay, so um, uh, you might want to delve into this further with focus groups, public deliberation, or something. So here's my modest proposal. Information is innocent until proven guilty. 
All right? Okay? If we can't prove that some information overwhelms or confuses patients or hurts their understanding or decision making in some way, again, burden is on you. Show not just that it's not relevant to expected utility maximization, but show that it actually hurts the efficient pursuit of utility. If you can't show a problem, make it available. Maybe give it to them. Maybe other considerations. And that is it. And I'm checking my time now because I don't care. <laughs> 20 minutes. Thank you. You're clapping because it was 20 minutes and 8 seconds. Thank you. I have 10 minutes for discussion. It's great that you left the 10 minutes for discussion so we can, talk uh, we can discuss both talks. Uh, your talk reminded me on, on, on a lot of things that I didn't really cover. So my question for you is, uh, I didn't quite understand, maybe you put an introduction, I missed it. What exactly, I mean, I always, you know, the rationality ultimately is about goals. What, was, what is the goal of providing this comparative uh, information? What, what are you supposed to achieve with that? Okay, I don't understand the question because I, 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 so, 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 you, so you're when we give a, patients to giving a patient giving an information. To, to help them make an informed choice, yeah. Um, and you want to give them comparative uh, information. And so what, what exactly, what exactly you were trying to achieve? Taking better care of the patient. Allowing yeah. them to make a choice with full information. So what, what, what would be the goal here? Providing better medical care for the patient, allowing them to make an informed choice that allows them to pursue their own how ends. That, how that is, um, how this is assessed? That's what I was asking. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm saying. So you didn't have a goal to begin with. It was just like. A no, general. I said my goal three times. Should I say it again? It's medical care of the patient, good care of the patient, taking care of people, helping them avoid disease and make choices that fit with their preferences and their choices for living a flourishing life. Okay. Is that, is that, I mean, yeah. I, I, no, no, it's actually, my fighting here, my fighting here is not because I'm a mean guy or I want to fight. It's because I believe that actually specificity has to be justified. In fact, this is going to be an argument I'm happy to have throughout my philosophy of life. I'm an MD, PhD in philosophy, and I'm, I, I believe that philosophy is useful when the pursuit of specificity or the application of models to questions in philosophy of science or medical ethics or any field is motivated by a reason. Specificity in itself is a, is a um, fetish. And so I believe that in the early talks today, when I was excited was when people said, we have a real problem, which is overuse, say, just for an example, and we need to actually figure out things about clinical decision making because we can actually address real problems or real issues by figuring this out and actually teaching our patients, teaching our doctors better or improving healthcare. Just saying, I don't have a full model for all of medical decision making, I'm gonna spend my life figuring out a better model, I believe is a really pretty close to a waste of time. Unless the goal is a very deep understanding, which is very abstract, and I understand that as being a goal, but I would question actually the application of resources and your resources to it. I really do, I, I, I'm, I am deeply a philosopher, and I'm deeply a pragmatist. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, thanks, I may have, there was, um, while I was doing my useless task for you of keeping time, not useless for everybody else, but for you it was useless, uh, there was, <laughs> Uh, there was one point when my That's buzzer... That's my goal. He has my goal. My goal is to just get on time. Uh, with, there was one point when my buzzer went off, so I fear that if you address this... You may have addressed this question in that sort of 30 seconds when the first buzzer that I didn't even show you went off. Um, but you, um, you talk about um, this might be... This, uh, the um, a comparative data might be useful because it helps them satisfy... It might actually help them improve utility. Um, but I wonder whether another approach to it um, again, if I was understanding you weren't getting it this quite, is that it's actually the data that they need to make the decision that they want, which is to say, much like in economics, or at least the way I understand with a lot of economics, people aren't interested by and large in how much money they have or how little money they have. Right? They're interested in how much money they have compared to the person next door. Uh, I'm not an economist, so forgive me. I mean, that's clearly a, a gross over but there is this thought, and, and, um, and it's being talked about a lot now. Um, and I wonder whether people, it, it, I mean, it's a little bit about regret, but not only about regret, people are willing to undertake certain risks in, yeah. order, to be t in order to not die of breast cancer if right. they didn't have to do it. Right. But if they're already less likely to die of breast cancer, I'm not going to take any risks to deal with breast right. cancer, even though I might die of it, right. which could have been avoided. So it's great, Jeremy. It's a great question. I really appreciate that question. Um, and here's exactly, one. You don't really need to answer. I mean, it was just no, no. I've got an answer. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be quick. I thought I because you know you. I only care about time. No, no, it's a great question. And actually, my first paper, the one in theoretical medicine, which is a bit of a hash of a paper again, because I was teaching myself expected utility theory 
as I was going, because I sort of sensed there was something there and I wanted to learn about it. But um, one of the points I made there was, you know, the question, the assumption is the utility of having a heart attack or the utility of having elevated risk of breast cancer. Maybe that's the utility to, to that. Right? Not, we, we assume the utility, the negative utility, is just of dying of breast cancer or having breast cancer. But I actually speculated in that paper that you might want to assign a utility to just having elevated breast cancer risk, just the risk itself. A person might want to have normal risk, and that might be a rational preference. Now, remember, rationality, somebody put up Hume, Dr. Dol Dolbovic, I believe, put up Hume's quote, right, that you don't assess preferences, you just assess how you achieve preferences. And so if it's true that we don't assess the rationality of preferences themselves, the preference to have normal levels of risk might itself have utility, in which case, of course, comparative risk information is going to be a w reasonable thing to, to, to disclose. In fact, the argument against disclosing comparative risk information must be based in part on a rejection of the idea that just having normal risk has itself utility for some people. Um, and I have another set, which is, what's the, uh, yeah, okay. I'll tell you something else later, Jeremy. Go ahead. In uh, your comparative risk analysis, I'm wondering if you considered vari variable risk over time. In other words, if you tell a patient that the risk is 12% when it should have been 6%, they might think that, wait a minute, my risk was at some point in time in the past 6%, now it's 12%, there's something wrong, it's going to be even higher in the future, and so I need to do something about it now. Excellent. But if you tell a patient that it's less than that, wait a minute, I'm doing something right, I don't need to really care about this. Right. No, that's fascinating. Um, right. I mean, if you, again, that's almost another heuristic you try to counteract, right? Because you're basically letting them know that, that they should not. So, you know, if your risk is below average, we just talked about whether that's a utility in itself. But it might be actually taken by a patient and maybe even by a doctor to say that actually there's, there's good reason to think that certain things are not happening now. It might be actually evidence for something else. And actually, you may have a heuristic based on it that you can counteract. So there are a lot of, right, the, the, the human mind, right, is stranger than we think and may have rationality behind it that we don't always know. That was, again, one of the lessons I got from the morning talks, and something which is a deep lesson for philosophers working on clinical judgment and on patient choice. So I, I agree, a lot of op possibilities. I'm not sure how to test for them, but I'd say the fact that they are possibilities, again, undermines the um, blanket rejection of certain kinds of information. So I'd uh, comment that comparative risk is probably more relevant to a patient simply because they would view that as the risk that they control. Yeah, sure. So we've looked at this with blood donation and or receiving blood and alternatives to blood. And you can say the absolute risk of getting HIV from blood is infinitesimally small. But if I can do something to mitigate even that infinitesimally small risk, it's reasonable. Whilst the baseline risk in the population, they're going to say, even though the absolute number is high, I'm, I accept that as uncontrollable. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Actually, we get told this by patients all the time, that they really do think they can do something about elevated risk, and they don't. It, it's hard to separate out the pieces of that mentality, right? Are they really falsely believing? I mean, they may be just making a mistake to think you can control elevated risk better than you can control average risk. It may be that tamoxifen, I'm told, cuts risk of breast cancer in half no matter what your starting risk was. It's just not worth it if your risk starts low. I don't know if that's true, and patients may be assuming that that's not true, and again, it's sort of a scientific question. I guess I'd say this, though. If it is not true that elevated risk is more easily controlled than normal risk, then I guess you'd have to try to head off that misperception in the disclosure. So really enjoyed your presentation, and just a question whether in any of your empirical studies you actually talked about probabilities as probabilities are talked about. You're 95% confident that the risk is uh, 6%. So did you, or 93% or 17%, have you ever introduced uh, ranges of uncertainty around? So point estimates are really great. You've halved it. Great. 50% absolute risk reduction or relative risk reduction. Have you ever introduced measures of uncertainty to see how patients respond to them? Ross, we're going to have a long talk over lunch. Um, so, so I have not, so it's a short, I'm speaking a joke that I was going to go into my second talk, but because I saved so much time, right? Um, so, Ross, though, I have not. Uh, so, one of my good friends, one of my growing collaborators, Paul Han, who's one of the leading people on uncertainty presentation, and actually, he and I have been talking lately. So, the reason I don't is because I think that when you tell a person in my studies that they have a 6% chance in their lifetime of getting colon cancer, that fact itself is very hard to um, utilize. It, again, is processed through gist and assumptions and all kinds of things. And so actually adding uncertainty bars to it doesn't really add much to the informed level of that decision. 
No, so Paul Han has studied it. He's one of the leading people. And I think Paul has come to the conclusion himself after about five of these studies that it really does not add much. Now, again, arguable field. You know, it's a philosophically um, fertile area because knowing whether it's helpful or not is, again, the incredibly difficult measurement question. Do I have time for one more? I think I do. Okay. Oh, thank you. I hope I'll be clear enough. Um, my question was about uh, where to stop in... in um, uh, giving comparative risk information because once you uh, well you can really convince me that it's worth no uh, adding <laughs> comparative risk information but it seems that to me from a philosophical point of view there's no end to um, the possibility of okay so for example you can say well if you take this pill you have you you'll be um, your your risk of having cataract will right. Right. and then uh, given that your risk of something else blah, right. So in some sense, it seems that when you decide that one right. piece of comparative risk information is the one that you give, right. you have also you have, you have already right. um, 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 assumed some constraint. Right. No? Outstanding. Instead. Outstanding question. But note, remember, the attack on it was not that we've reached some kind of cognitive load with the patient and we've given them enough. It's that this is bad information. It is misleading it is distracting, it is a mistake to give it. That's what I'm arguing against, but you're right. I make decision aids and I test them, and boy, I, I live in, I mean, the, I leave it all in the field when we make a decision aid. We argue over every word, every period, because everything you put in is one more piece of cognitive load, and we try to make the best ones we can, and it's hard. So, good point. <laughs>